You can see the love uh, that College Show has. I, I can't thank you guys enough for your, your generosity and the support. And David, I definitely pumped this class up. So you could see the amount of all the sponsors, may all the sponsors have blessings. I'll believe die. David, it's so nice to have you here. So nice to have you here. I, you're one of my you're one of my mentors that I've we've learned so much and I spread your teachings off to the to, to the whole world. And I want to really do this class today because I've seen so many people in pain, so many people, you know, in, in abusive relationships, so many people with shell and bite issues, so many people with low self-esteem. And I think you are the master in taking things personal and self-esteem. I've never heard the clarity on how you've dealt with it and how you explain to it in your books. And I think this is what really we need to uh, to focus on. Um, one of the greatest things that you, you know, you, you said is, you know, th that chart where Self-esteem goes up, ego goes down. And I think that's like that, that one line. It's just hours and hours of, of therapy and content could be on it. So David, please thank you for thank you for having thank you for being here. And then we want to get to some we want to get to some tough questions today. We really want to get Good. into uh, you know, people that are, you know, constantly getting rejected in relationships, people that are constantly getting uh you know abused, men uh, verbally abused, and what advice you you can give them. I think. I think you've been doing this for 20 years, David. Uh, and then some, yeah. You've trained the FBI. Uh, you've trained, uh, I, I've, I've seen you on Oprah. I've given many, many books. One of his newest books is called Never Get Angry Again. And again, David, that what, I, what I love the best, and again, it's very my style, get to the point, what's the strategy, and let's get to the next move. And I think that's really how, why I love your teaching so much. Thank you. I'm a huge, as you know, huge fan of you and your, your work as well, of course. Thank you, David. Thank you. So, David, let's start. Let's start. All right. Why, why do we take things personal? Oh, wow. Why do we take things personally? Okay, so let's go delve into it. And again, as you well know, feel free to interrupt at any point. If I start talking too fast, tell me to slow down. But let me just give a, a short 60-second overview, as you alluded to before. Where we have self-esteem refers to the degree to which we love ourselves and feel worthy of good things in life. That means that I am able to connect with other people and to give and receive love. The degree to which I feel unworthy of that connection, I don't feel good about me. The ego now engages like a seesaw, as self-esteem goes down, the ego now engages and becomes larger. And its job is to compensate for my feelings of guilt, inferiority, shame, to protect my self-esteem or my, my core, and at the same time, project an image of how I want other people to see me. So then, whenever something happens, the bigger my ego, the more inclined I'm going to assume two things. One, that it's about me. Why? Because egocentric people, the, literally, you know, like the, the heliocentric theory, like everything rolls around the sun, geocentric. Right? So the uh, egocentricity means everything rolls around me. Two people whispering in the corners, guy about me, guy cuts me off, guy, everything becomes about me. At the same time, not only do I take it personally, but I assume that it's because of a defect or deficiency within me. Because again, if the ego is existing to compensate for some sort of inferiority, that means then that if you're impolite to me, I'm not, or you do something, I'm not not only going to assume that it's directed to me, but that you know the real me, the unworthy part of me, the part of me that's not, that's not respected and loved, which then causes me to lash out. And then obviously leads to anger. So ultimately what we find here is that the core of anger really is fear. It's the fear mm. of being vulnerable, of being disconnected, of not being loved, not being accepted, not being in control. So it's my own lack of self-love that brings that fear. And that fear then leads to anger. It's funny because you, you've written in your book many times. Obviously, I don't have any books because I've memorized them all. But <laughs> yeah, it's funny because when we hit a parked car, we'll, we'll scream at the car. And he, you know, you'll yeah. bang on a chair. You're going to yell at the chair because it's, so it's, it's this obsession of a control that it's making us angry. And I think this is one of, one of the things that I really worked on is, is tr controlling less and, and trusting the process. And, and, and my anger completely changed. Because once you're trying to control everything, you almost guaranteed to be angry. Yes, almost guaranteed you're, you're to right. be angry. You're right. You're right. Because control says that everything should unfold according to my expectations and entitlement. And if they don't, then of course I'm going to be frustrated and disappointed. But if I'm not in control, if I recognize my job is just to put in the effort and to trust that God will take care of the rest, 
not only do I remain anger free, but I remain fear free. And it's funny, David, because you, you see this in 2021 and this, and this epidemic, this pandemic, you know, one guy's wearing a mask, he's yelling, why are you not wearing a mask? Why are you not with get vaccinated? It's everybody's forcing their stuff on everybody else. <laughs> yeah. You want to be, you want to be fine. Do what you have to do. But why are ah. you forcing? Why are you getting angry? And, you, and I would never forget when I was used to, you know, walking in the park and next thing, you know, I'm walking my daughter, some, some people, you know, people you'll yell at you. You could just yeah. see the, 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 the mass hysteria where, where this has gotten to is it's not enough that I, I can't control myself, but I want to control this. David, you mentioned many times in your relationship books, how you, we see that, and I've seen this so many times, where, where people, when they don't, when a p- person can't control himself, he'll try now to control others. That's right. And you, That's and right. you see this in relationships constantly. Speak a little bit about that. Because sure. people talk about, I'm in a controlling relationship. Everybody's yeah. the guy's controlling me. She's controlling me. Yeah. Speak yeah. a little bit about that. Good, right. So you're absolutely right. The less in control we are of ourselves, the more we try to control the people around us. And that's for two reasons. One is that if you, you take a step back uh, and, and you go to the source of low self-esteem, which invariably starts from in childhood, uh, you know, when a person grows up in an environment that's unpredictable or the love that they receive was conditional, it's natural for them to uh, have feelings of insecurity. So if I don't feel secure, my surrogate to that is if to control the environment around me. In other words, if I can control you, I can predict your behavior. If I can't control you, then I've got something else that's just out of control. So the less in control I am of myself, the less secure and confident I feel in me, the more I need to control the world around me. One of the greatest chapters you've, got, you've had is it's never too late to have a happy childhood. Yeah. You just mentioned you just mentioned that a lot of this stuff is, is childhood based on childhood and just explain to people because I've, I've this is a very common thing specifically in my rehab I've, I've helped so many people just on that concept that obviously our parents limitations it doesn't make us who we are and we don't know as children the difference but explain to people how it's never too late to have a happy childhood good very good so in in broad strokes is that when somebody does something to us the ego in us takes it personally, right? We make it about us. And we said before, the bigger the ego, the more we make it about us. What happens is, is that in childhood, we are as children entirely egocentric, right? Children by definition is supposed to be, everything revolves around them, which means then how they are treated by a parent is internalized as this is what I'm worth. For example, no seven-year-old is gonna say to themselves, wow, dad just lost the big account at work. That's why he's screaming, yelling at me. He'll have a drink, calm down, I'll be fine. No, the child mm-hmm. is gonna say, what is so broken, bad, defective, ugly inside of me that is causing this behavior? A child never for a second assumes it's the other guy. Now, as adults, of course, we're not, cons- we, you know, we, don't, we don't have that um, issue, right? Because we don't have an ego. But the degree to which we do have an ego, we don't uh, look at the other person's perspective. We're not able to empathize and validate because in order for me to get out of my own stuff and look at the world through your lens, I've got to take off my own glasses. But the more ensconced I am in my own position, the bigger my ego, I can't empathize, I can't validate, I can't see the world through your lens. It's only through mine, which means then is that everything revolves around me and how you treat me has everything to do with me. So one of the most powerful ideas to internalize is as follows. How somebody treats you is a reflection of their self-esteem. It speaks volumes of their self-worth and character, but says nothing about you. You give love, you give respect. If a person doesn't have it, they can't give it. So as children, we grow up, that idea just doesn't stick. We have to assume it's about us. But as adults today, we can break free and recognize that how we are treated today, how we're going to be treated tomorrow, and how we treat as children has zero to do with our worth. I'm not less worthy, you are not less worthy because somebody cannot give you love or respect that you deserve. It doesn't make you less. For example, when you're in a bad mood and you're treating Nate, not you, somebody else is in a bad mood. Me, me, me. Okay, fine. It's me, I've been there. Maybe not too well. Their self-worth didn't diminish, but your capacity to give it has. So it's insane that a person would say, oh, wow, I'm now worth less. I have to feel bad about me 
because somebody yelled at me. No, this person's capacity is limited. So when you recognize that the world is limited and their inability to give to you speaks volumes of them, but says nothing about you, you are free from all the emotional baggage. And that's why the book um, lays that out in that chapter and also other chapters about forgiving and about just getting rid of the junk and moving forward. You know, I, I heard, you know, one of the lines that I, I mentioned a lot of times in my recovery centers is just because somebody hurt you doesn't mean you have to hurt yourself. And yeah. the analogy would be like, you know, if somebody, you know, put a, put a, uh, you know, slash your tire, doesn't mean you have to go slash three other tires. And, and it right. seems to be what people just kind of, it seems to be that the minute they, they hurt, they're hurt right away. They just want to go hurt themselves. And it's, uh, where, where does that come from? Good. So, so I, was, I, was, I was hoping you'd get to that. Exactly right. That's the root. Why? Because if somebody hurts me and I take it personally, I now assume I'm worth what? Not much. Right. Now, what do you do with something that's not worth much? What do you do with some, <clears throat> let's take somebody else that we're angry with or we're frustrated with or upset with. We might not treat that person so well, particularly if we're in a negative space. So when we're angry and frustrated and upset with ourselves, where do we think that anger goes? Of course it goes to self-destructive behaviors. The math is simple. In much the same way that if you take somebody who's in a bad mood and he's upset with somebody and angry and frustrated, he's not gonna be treating him unfortunately too well. So with ourselves, if I come to believe that I'm not worthy, I'm not good, that, and that guilt and shame comp compounds itself, I am going to purposefully, willfully destruct, self-destruct, and get back at myself, that enemy in the mm -hmm. mirror, who I dislike so much. It's, un it's unbelievable. And, and this is, it's so, and, and this goes, it's a constant, constant, David, you know, it's, Every single day, we, we read in, in, in the Amida at the end of the Amida. Let me let me make myself like dust. Let me not be insulted. I mean, it's funny. We're praying every single day not to take things personal, even at yeah. night in the Shema before you go to sleep. Let me forgive. Let, let nobody else be punished because of my 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 sins. Let me forgive everybody. So you could see this is built in. Our sages already built this in that this is something you should have in our in our. But it seems to be that you know. To, I, this is the majority of the issues, toxic relationships. Dave, explain a little bit, which I, I lecture a lot to singles, that you know, the, the more low, according to the person's low self-esteem, the more needy they're going to be. Yeah. And once they become very needy, people don't want to be around needy people. People yeah. want some. People want some. If you if you if you if it's too available, sometimes it can backfire against you. So yeah. Let's talk about that relationship. That sure. the importance of giving. You know, I, I speak about it a lot of times specifically girls and not to get too physical in the relationships before because once people get what they get obviously they get clouded they get clip on the and the, the, the whatever's uh, kabbalistically that area but you could see that when, when people get what they want they they somehow they check out and it seems yes. that this is where people keep on doing the same thing they say well if i don't do it I'm, they're not gonna love me. they're not gonna, not gonna love me and i actually actually become the opposite no right it's so true no Buddy will ever lose somebody else because they didn't get physical. It just, it is, we, we right. think it, and the person will try and convince us of it, and we want to do it. It just doesn't happen. I mean, you can ask honestly and genuinely, and anyone that answers honestly will give you that answer. It doesn't happen. Um, we get, unfortunately, we get tricked into believing that, but it's, it's never the case. Right. Uh, besides which, if somebody wants you because of something you do, then they don't really want you. They want you because of something you do. And that's a whole different story. Uh, but yeah, when a person has low self-esteem, having a self-esteem doesn't necessarily mean confidence because there are people who are confident, but they're full of arrogance and hubris right. and um, they're, they, they're not very charismatic. Real charisma, actually I've got a book coming out, I don't know, maybe like two years. It's, it's in the pipeline mm -hmm. on, on charisma. Real charisma is about a deep feeling of self-love which, which means then that I don't have a big ego. So not having a big ego and I love me means I can love you. I can look at you, I can, I can accept you, I can empathize with you, I'm able to connect. But the ego blocks that connection because when a person's egocentric, they're just consumed with themselves. And make no mistake, low self-esteem will also produce that ego, it just manifests in a different way. People sometimes think you know, that this loud, obnoxious, arrogant guy is the only one with an ego, not true. If a person right. has low self-esteem, then they are too egocentric. They're ensconced and wrapped up in their own pain, their own suffering, their own stuff. And they can't pay attention to someone else. They try to, and they try it, but they're really, and they also come across as very um, 
as you say, very needy. And if, quite frankly, they are as needy as the other type, but the other type doesn't yeah. want to cede control, doesn't want to admit that they're vulnerable. So they have more of a bulldozer approach. This person, you know, their cards are on the table, but at the same time, they're not very attractive cards. Hmm. Very nice. You know, one of the things that, you know, I speak a lot about is um, self-esteem is, and, and, and the, you, you, you really mentioned it amazing. This line I, I love. When you, when you love yourself, you put an effort in yourself. But when you don't love yourself, you'll lose yourself. So the, the, the direct effort a person puts into himself is based on his self-esteem. Talk that's a, a little bit about quote. the amount. That's, yeah, that's impressive. <laughs> I, I got them all, David. I, I think got it. I know that your book's back and forth. But the, the, why would effort? I mean, we're talking about how much effort we need to put today in losing but, weight versus uh, everything right. that requires so much effort. Yeah. But why is yeah. one person putting more effort than another person? I mean, right. what's, what's the key? It's a key element. It's a, bo it's a bomb question. I just actually did a series on Torah Anytime on willpower. And willpower is, is, is so misunderstood. And we've been sold the bill of goods about willpower. We can, that's a whole other sugi unto itself. But right. the engine of self-discipline is self-esteem. That was, if I don't love me, I'm not going to want to invest Bingo. in me. That's the right. math, right? Notice you give and you put energy and effort into something you like, or love, or respect and care about. You get, whether it's a, you know, uh, a cheese sandwich that you, you take a lot of care in, your car, your spouse, whatever it is, you invest. If I don't like me, I'm not going to sacrifice right now for tomorrow. I'm interested in the burger. I'm in, emotionally, spiritually, and physically, financially, whatever it is, I'm going to get into the now to feel good because I don't care about investing in tomorrow. The emotional maturity is really the wisdom that comes with recognizing there is a tomorrow and I'm worthy of investing in that tomorrow. I care enough about me that I care about me tomorrow. Person doesn't care about themselves, their engine of self-discipline and the fuel of willpower is they're running on fumes. And we know that example from the marshmallow experience by Walter yes. Mischel, right? right? That whole example of uh, taking one marshmallow versus two marshmallows and their, their whole life was completely, the numbers went up, uh, they were healthier, they were more successful yeah. based on that having, and this is, a, this is definitely the me message in the Torah, be able to have you know, self-control. Let's, yes. let's talk about perspective. Mm. Again, you know, when we're also, when we just want to clarify with the audience, when we're talking about the ego, we're also talking about the Yitzhahara. It's, it's, it's the same thing. It's, not, right. it's, it's the same thing. So it's funny how, you know, there's a constant message in the Torah, do not seek revenge. But somehow <laughs> it feels to be like when, when, when we're married, obviously well married, it seems to be like spouses, unfortunately, when they're mad at each other, they'll, they'll you know, they'll use emotional uh, uh, blackmail. <laughs> You did something wrong to me. I'm not talking to you. So this is, it seems to be a common thing that unfortunately this happens. It obviously grows into resentment and it grows into that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Co common, so, so, but, but, but not so yes. healthy. <laughs> but but it's, it's funny. Why, why, what's the need to always seek revenge? What's that need to always seek revenge? Right. Very good. So what happens is this. If somebody does something to me, right, and my ego is engaged, I feel vulnerable. I feel a loss of power. I feel a loss of control. Um, and in the, the ego, the Yetzirah, either with, and synonymously, is the tricks us to believing that by becoming angry, I end up, well, so look, for, let's take a step back. What is, what, when a person gets scared, why they become angry? The answer is because anger masks and or, and or channels that fear. I don't want to feel scared. So anger is the illusion of control. If I become angry, now I can act in a way that I couldn't if I was scared, right? If I'm scared of you or of something, all right, I'm going to run, duck, and hide. If I become angry, now I can go ahead and I can assert myself or express myself, obviously not in a healthy way. But the problem is, is that the threat where we become angry or, and we get that adrenaline uh, running and all the, uh, um, the cortisol and all the uh, neurotransmitters, what happens is that when somebody does something to me and my ego's engaged, it becomes an existential threat. I believe my very life is threatened. Who I am, my existence is at question. That's why I become angry. So revenge, um, lust, honor, all these spawn from anger. Revenge really is just a you know, step sibling of becoming angry. Yeah. When you become angry, you can unleash it in a couple of ways. You can, there's five different ways. You can be aggressive and assertive. 
you can be passive. Maybe you can't confront the person head on. So you get back at them little ways. Maybe you call that revenge. Other people may repress, other people suppress. Different ways of channeling anger in different, uh, different directions. Revenge is simply just a mechanism that the ego uses to try to even the score, to set some, mm. some kind of, uh, to feel some kind of justice and to feel less um, vulnerable and to, to sort of um, get back at that person and even the score. Amazing, amazing. I speak very much about perspective. And unfortunately today, you see this a lot, that people are going through tremendous challenges. And unfortunately, if they don't have that right relationship with their creator, they're always looking at it as it's always happening to me. Right. And this is one of the things that, you know, obviously I'm going through tremendous challenges, people are going through, but if you have, when you have a healthy perspective, you stop becoming, you know, a Vic with a victim mindset. And this is where, you know, you, how do you, one of the signs that I think we would know when somebody's growing is when perspective starts changing. That's a sign that the, the self-esteem has increased. And, you know, when I see this in my, my, my centers, I see, wow, perspective is changing. That's when the sign of growth. Talk about the difference between, talk about why perspective is such, a, such an important thing, where it's, where it's rooted, you know. Very good. So perspective is synonymous with sanity, right? The wider our perspective, the, the more more the greater purview the more reality we take in as the ego engages the ego blocks perspective because it makes sense if the ego if, if perspective is reality right then as my ego takes over i'm not able to see what is i don't look through a, a window as much as i as i see in, through i look at a mirror i'm just seeing a projection of my own wants and needs so as my ego becomes more encompassing my perspective shrinks as my perspective shrinks um i become much more emotionally unstable because the wider my perspective, the more balanced I am. In much the same right. way, as by way of illustration, you take a, um, a tight rope walker. it has got that long pole. It's a long pole for a reason, because the longer it goes out, the more balanced it is in the center. Without a pole or a short pole, it's easy to get toppled over. So like a child, for example, a child sees everything right in the moment, and it's very black and white, which is why they have mood swings. You know, They can be smiling mm. one day, upset the next day, and so on. They completely lack uh, any degree of perspective. They'd rather have one lollipop now than two tomorrow, whatever it is. Right. It's only living now. So the degree to which we're able to pull back the lens and see more clearly, we're able to gain just a greater emotional footing and not only see and accept reality, but respond to it in a healthy way. Person who lacks perspective doesn't want to see. If they see, they don't want to accept. If they accept, they don't want to respond. David, you had a great, great quote on pain becomes either we either we when we accept pain it becomes growth when we don't accept it it becomes suffering that resistance becomes suffering yeah so this yeah. is and I, and I think this is the mental it's not like you're born with mental health this is something we have to develop this resilient mindset the ability to accept it accept what's what's happening and obviously the reward is obviously growth but it seems to be today that this is some, sometimes people are spending years and decades in therapy just on the acceptance part. How come it's easier for others to accept and, and harder for others and they're just they're living in the past? And Right, right. Well, because right, because that what happens is when, when a person grows up and the, the love that they received was conditional, meaning if a child behaved a certain way, then the parent connected. The child didn't, then the parent uh, you know, connected more harshly, or the child was made to be held to unreasonable standards. And by the way, just we're not casting aspersions on parents. You know, it's good for everyone to remember that, right. you know, it's easy for us, you know, it, you know, you take somebody who doesn't like our behavior and we may very well blame our parents, sure. our environment, this is me. When it comes to somebody else, we don't cut them the same slack. We blame right. that person. Now, why can't that person point the finger at the next guy? So, you know, we, we cut ourselves slack, but we should do the same thing for everyone else. Our parents and people in our lives, the people do the best that they can with what they have and make no mistake. Regardless of our experience, regardless of the people around us, their emotional health, the imprint that we had on childhood, everything was necessary, tailor-made, custom-made for a good and for our growth, for our tikkun, for our fixing, for the reason why we're here. These experiences all shaped and formed all of us to get right to the moment where we're right here, right now, speaking to you. Now the question only is, do you want to continue to blame the rest of the world, or do you want to accept responsibility to move forward? The choice is always ours. But I got to tell you, there are fewer things more delicious and more empowering than saying, okay, I'm going to accept responsibility right. for the quality of my life right now. 
and go forward. When you even say that and when you acknowledge it, it is so emotionally freeing. Yeah, it's a, and, 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 and also you get, you get much more chesed in heaven. So, so yes. David, I, I, I recognize a pattern, obviously, that I recognize it's not so easy, just, just person learning this stuff. It's, I don't think it's enough. I think they have to actually have to pray for it. I think they actually have to, to, to ask the creator to open up their mind. Uh, I, think, I think this is where, the, where people sometimes get stuck. Where they, they, okay, they get it, they learn it, they learn it, and next thing you know, it keeps on happening over and over. The, the point of, you know, getting to the, your creator and saying, listen, I, I'm completely surrendering. I'm, I have no, I'm trying this, but until you help me, I, I'll never be able to accomplish and work on this midah, work on this bad character. Yeah, yeah. As, as you well know, the first step of the 12 steps is to acknowledge that, that you're powerless as a creator, that, that, that it's not, you know, you have to bring your game to the table, but we can do nothing without God. We, we, we can't. So right. the reason why prayer is so powerful is because in of itself, it deflates the ego. And it was, if I'm the son of the universe, who am I praying to? So the very act of praying and asking Hashem to help us is the, the, the very means and the mechanism that creates us into a healthier, ego-free kli. Because the Talmud explains that man and God can't occupy the same space. If a person is too consumed with themselves, there's no room for a creator, which is why one of the five things that change a person's mazel is uh, through prayer is because it diminishes the ego and allows for that sense of humility. And that's the gateway to allow for that sort of that, that, that conduit to growth. David, I see that, you know, I remember going up in high school and going up, they should have a class on why you shouldn't take things personal. But we're learning about <laughs> dinosaurs and geometry and, <laughs> and the stupidest, but it looks like the, the school system has not changed that. People are coming out unprepared, and now more than ever today, people are just coming out with no idea. On you know, they'll they'll go to high school, they go to college. Next thing you know, they get rejected from their first job, they get into a divorce, and yeah. they're not set up for this crisis. Not that you said it so good. The, we, the, people are are every generation is becoming less emotionally resilient, and that's where really, we're not just woefully unprepared academically for sure, but emotionally we are more and more fragile every generation. Today, you say pass the salt to a kid. And it's like, why are you screaming at me? It's like, my gosh. <laughs> right. You, you, gave an, uh, you gave an unbelievable example one time how I believe your daughters were fighting and one of your daughters was saying, uh, please tell, tell the other daughter not to make fun of me again. And then you like, why, why are you so offended in the first place? I thought that was yeah. unbelievable. You right. Teach them right. that at that age. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what it is? It's, it's, it's two things. It's, you know, when, when you have one child that's be at school or at home, whatever it is, it's just the two messages for each child. First off, the child that gets picked on, see what happens is this, you know, one person bullies the other and say, how could you call that name? You know, you call her name, she feels sad. All you're doing is reinforcing in that child that being called the name means something. It doesn't. What it means is that person's got a problem, which is why certainly with my own kids, they could have fun. Okay, so this child who got called the name, what does it mean? It means zero. It means that your sister is in a bad mood or your sister, nothing to do with you. Now to the sister that called you the name, right? What are you doing calling people names? It's not good for you. The, the reason why we don't call other people names is because it, it's not good for us to do that, to treat someone disrespectfully. That's the message for that daughter. And the other one is, what difference does it make? What a person called you a pink elephant? Does that make you a pink elephant? That's by the way, you say that, that phrase in my house, all the, everyone will start laughing because they know what it means. I, I, by the way, with kids, it's very, very hard because children, because they're egocentric, they take everything personally. Personal. The degree to which we can help them to see that it's not about me is fantastic because as they tra transition to adulthood, that is going to be the most uh, powerful mechanism for them to be able to keep on moving forward irrespective of people who are not nice and they're going to meet not nice people. David, I've seen a pattern that people have tried, you know, they're going into things and they, they've tried and like, they, they have a learned help in this mindset yeah. where they believe this is who I am. This is who I am. I can never fight this. But I, I, I speak about the importance of when you make one victory, one time you have self-control, one time you don't take things personally. Yeah. That's yeah. the beginning yeah. of everything. It's yeah. the importance of not thinking, no, just do it one time. It's something in self-esteem is not something you're born with, it's something that you develop. 
And it is a muscle, you know? Right. It, it is a muscle, it is a muscle. It is so true. And each and every time we exercise it, uh, we're able to, to take that energy and then transfer it over, whether it's willpower, whether it's self esteem, whatever. Whenever we act responsibly, we're building on to that foundation of a person and a mentality and a mindset who is in control of themselves. And when a person doesn't feel like they can trust themselves and they're not in control of themselves, it's obviously it's, it's, if it can come downhill from there, but we can turn it around. And the beginning of personal growth begins with accepting who we are, how we are, where we are. So if, you know, an example I often give is if you're in Miami and you wanna to go to Boca, right? You type in the address in Boca. The first thing the satellite's gonna do is locate that you're in Miami. Right. So right. I can't move from point A to point B unless I acknowledge I'm a point A. I can't grow. I can't move forward unless I say, OK, fine. This is me. The good, the bad, the ugly. I accept it. I don't love it all. I don't approve of it all. That's OK. But I accept it where I am, how I am, who I am. And that's how we move forward. I think the the eight Sahara, the, the ego is, based, you know, anytime people are in a very, very, uh, very negative emotional state, they're always stuck on the permanence. This is my this is going to be permanent like this. And that, you know, deliberates, it, it doesn't allow them to have the strength to even get going. So and I love you. So important. You're like, I, you connect amazing dots, right? And, and also when I, I speak on clinic and, and parenting, I also encourage parents to recognize just that fact is that when your child does something, the reason you get so angry and frustrated is you think that this, this oh my gosh, how are they going to get married? How are they going to end up? He puts his feet on the chair. He's six years old. He's going to, right? So right. I tell parents, if you knew for sure your child would not be doing this when they were an adult, would you still be upset? Like, no. no, correct. Wow. But this, it, it, I, I think it's in our DNA, this worry, you know, just the constant worry and, and this heaviness. It's just, I think this is, unfortunately, this is what was bringing a lot of people to others, you know, to, to get into other speakers and secular things is because we built, unfortunately, there's been too much of a heaviness. Um, yeah. There's yeah. a lot of heaviness. Yeah. There's a lot of yeah. heaviness. People yeah. are approaching Judaism. They're going to show. They feel the heaviness. They don't feel the light and the and the liberation and the. Uh, it just. It, I don't know what what's happening with this. And this is something when I when I before I got into Rabbi Nachman's teachings, I definitely felt you know, like the judgment and the heaviness and the. I guess is they have to people treat each other the way they feel about themselves. For and sure, this is something that we really have to change. I think Hasidus gives us that, you know the love and the, the warmth that we're, we're really missing because right now, you know, when you have, you know, you've got real events going on, you really need the community. You need the warmth in the community. You need that network to at you, least you help do. you build up. You do. That's so true. And what happens is that when a person, it becomes more egocentric, you know, vis-a-vis -vis just being irresponsible. Again, the reason why we had low self-esteem in the first place is, you know, there's legitimate shame, there's toxic shame. Legitimate shame is, is something that we acquire from acting beneath our madrig. We do something that's irresponsible. It's a self-correcting mechanism. It's on a shama, our soul, our conscience speaking to us. So when we don't correct our behavior and we act irresponsible and the ego engages, the challenge there is it cuts us off from our authentic self because we end up wearing masks and playing games because we're not connected mm -hmm. to our shama. And it cuts us off from other people because I can't be real. I can't be honest. I can't give and receive love. See, if I don't love me, Gadalia, and I'm consumed with myself, I can't imagine why you would love me. Why would you love right. someone so unlovable? At the same time, you can only give what you got. So if I don't love me, how am I going to connect right. and love how with can you? I love, love you? you? Right. So dating you know, 101. We, right, right. We become our own worst problem. And again, if you just step back to psychology here, is that the ego engages to compensate for my feelings of guilt, inferiority, and shame. So if I do chuva on everything I've already done, I start with a clean slate. I love me, I accept me. I go forward completely uninhibited by the Yetzirah. And I can choose to do responsibly and act responsibly without any compunction or hesitation. I'm not worried about being embarrassed, only about being ashamed. The embarrassment is a function of the ego, shame is a function of the shama. And I build on mm -hmm. that. The more responsible I am, the more fuels my self-esteem and the greater my self-esteem, the more I want to invest in myself. Amazing, amazing. It's, and it's funny, it says one who's embarrassed, I believe what the Mara says that all his sins are forgiven. So it's like, if you come back with love, you, you, you almost get double. So it's like the whole system is made for us to win, but somehow we, yeah. we haven't gotten, we haven't gotten that. It it's a level playing like, field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you come back with a, with a different attitude that this is happening for you, you almost, the sins become mitzvot. 
Yep. So, so it's, I mean, we're, we're born to win. We're, we're really born to win. I feel like we're born to win. But because of the because of this heaviness and because of this lack of faith, this is unfortunately we, we're supposed to, you know, we spread light amongst the nations. And it seems to be that we have to pick up our game by, by fixing ourselves. Yeah. By fixing ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. What do you advise, David, for the what do you advise for the single scene? What do you what, what would you advise? What do you what kind of stuff are you getting? Seems to be this is a big uh it's a big yeah. problem in the single market. I'm, I'm trying to do a lot of events together, but right. Right. But the pickiness, so I, I, I do, the pickiness of this, it, it just, it's just yeah. very, very difficult. Very it, difficult it, about that. It is. And I, I look, it is difficult. And I think we can be our own worst enemy sometime. And there's 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 hours to talk about with that because I'm also sure. very heavily involved in, in Shaduchim. Um, and I would encourage maybe just a couple of, of ideas. Yeah, then. just a couple of ideas. Right? Sure. One would be that, you know, sometimes we want to marry somebody because we want a... To, 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 to buttress, to reinforce our own self-image. So I need this person, this guy, this girl, in order that I should feel good about me. But it may not even be someone that's good for me, but I want other people to think, ah, mm. he married so-and-so, she married so-and-so. So now I'm just looking for somebody to sort of, you know, to, to be part of my projection, which ultimately is, is, is obviously not, not a healthy way to go forward. I want somebody who is going to be good for me um and also when it comes to marriage a couple of questions um i think that uh recognizing solid emotional health in somebody else is important and you know knowing the right questions to ask to make sure that you don't marry somebody who's not so emotionally sure. solvent uh we can walk through a couple of those maybe now or another time um but ultimately my ability to connect with other people is going to require my ability to accept me, because if I don't accept me, I, I'm not accepting you. If I don't accept me, then I'm just sort of a shell walking around and shells can't connect with each other. So the more I love me and the more I work on accepting and loving me, the more accepting I can be of other people and the more, uh, the greater my connection is going to be with them because I now know that I'm worthy mm -hmm. of receiving as well as accepting love. love. Right. This is why when you're in a good soul state, you really focus more on what can you bring to the relationship and not, not what you can get out of the relationship. That's right. I, that's right. I think that's the, really the key. Unfortunately, people are going in there. What can I get out of this relationship? Right. And, 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 and I'm not the tell, but you know, you marry somebody that that person changes. I keep on telling it to everybody, whoever mm -hmm. you marry, that person changes. What do you think? You, this is who you get person changes, but I, I guess it changes for your benefit to get the best out of you. Um, so it's not even who you guarantee, you guarantee to get that person. This stuff happens in life and people go through events, you grow together, but you're not, it's not like, there's no guarantees in any way. That's what you, you know, it's, when you make a decision and you, you have trust in God and you have a Torah, a Torah life, you know, at least you have somewhere to go when there's chaos. Right. Right. And, you know, I encourage people to recognize sometimes a question that comes, I know you get this question probably 10 times more than I do, but you know, how to know this is the right one for me. Um, but, you know, they say there's other guys, there's other girls, but true, but Hashem put this one in front right. of you, you know, that's got to count for something. <laughs> you know, it's, it's amazing. We talk about decision fatigue. I think you had it yeah. in Free Will Works, yeah. where people, countries gave away a, 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 an organ based on the five seconds of checking a, a box. So people have such, the, the, this is decision fatigue. It's, they're exhausted with this decision fatigue. It is Too many exhausting. decisions. It is. There is. And also research shows is that the more decisions you have, the more options available, the longer it takes to make a decision. But here's what's most amazing. The less satisfied you are ultimately wow. with the decision that you make, which is astounding. You walk in the ice cream store, vanilla, chocolate, strawberry, you're going to be more satisfied with your choice than if there were 31 flavors and you picked one. It took you longer wow. and you're going to be less satisfied, which is why you can't go after the whole world. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. That's a great, what a, what a great study. I guess it goes back to the Gemara that says the one who tries to take too much gets nothing at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. The study beautiful. was done by a fellow by the name of Dr. Barry Schwartz. Uh, and it's beautiful. something he, he, he created something, he, he uh, coined a uh, term called the optimizing option. Pretty much you find something or someone that's, excuse me, the satisfying option that satisfies all of your requirements. And that's it. And then you go forward because you reach a point of diminishing returns so quickly, but not just diminishing returns, but it drains you and it makes you less equipped to be able to make a decision and to focus and to think rationally for the next person. David, I, I, I've spread the book Tomer Devorah. 
I strongly recommend the, the book Tomer Devora, the Kabbalah of forgiveness. And, you know, one way I believe that to get through trauma is just to go through the Tomer Devora, use an attribute to be able to forgive somebody. It's such a, I think it's such a powerful book to be able to, to understand your role here in this world is to ultimately imitate your creator. It, one of the most powerful books I've ever learned. It's just, it's, and it seems to be that all the psychology is really in that, in that book, to say the truth. Because at the end sure. of the day, we could just look at it as an, op instead of looking at it as a, you know, getting insulted, it's an opportunity. Yeah. You know. All yeah. right, so I think we're going to open up the question for five, six questions. And um, anything else you want to talk about, David? Just want to get a couple of books that we, the, I would, again, guys, strongly recommend. Free Will Works, phenomenal book, and Never Get Angry Again. Um, those two books are just phenomenal. You know, front to cover, I, I think I've read them 20 times each. And every time I learn more, more, more. And, I, and David, you've, you've, you've studied NLP? Uh, yeah, uh, we're going back maybe 25 years ago. I learned, um, I, actually it was in, uh, in Florida, Tampa, I think, um, right. where I studied with actually by with Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins head trainer. Right. That's where I learned it from. Yeah, I see that. I see the resemblance in some of the stuff that you speak to with, I guess that's where you guys got, wow, amazing. Did it really help you? Was it something that, that made you know, a big I, difference or no, you know, I, it, it? it's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, you know, very often people that learn just one discipline, you know, it's like an expression, every hammer sees a nail. They think it's a cure-all for everything. There's a lot of solid science there. It's, I just personally, I find it fascinating. A lot of useful ideas. It doesn't fix every problem for every person, but I like right. to put it into the tool belt because there's a, there's a lot of chakma there. Got it. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's a lot of building a lot of rapport and building a lot of yeah, uh, right. uh, reading a person, right. which is really shalom bayit. You have to be able to read your spouse <laughs> and you have to be able to build rapport, you know? And duck, and duck toasters when necessary. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're going we're gonna to give a couple of questions. We'll, we'll open the floor for a couple of questions. But again, sure. it's, this is just to give you guys a, pre a preview of, of, of David's books. And uh, there's just so much wisdom and, and, and for every type of relationship. You know, obviously, you have you definitely have a book on how to deal with emotionally unstable. Before we actually, before we open up the questions, give us more or less a little bit about how do you deal with emotionally unstable people? Okay. In a, wow. in a short, in a short, uh, I forgot right. to mention that. I mentioned everything but that. Okay, so the, the, there's there's a lot there. I'm going to start talking, and you tell me when you want me to stop um, or shift directions. Okay, because okay, okay. so we're all pretty much a little neurotic, which is okay, because the option, other options being psychotic. So we're all a little bit, we have our mission guys, mm -hmm. we have our stuff, that's okay. As a person becomes less healthy, meaning that their, their self-love, their, their core uh, diminishes, and their ego now engages, and it's blocking reality. Again, we said before, that perspective is synonymous with reality, my ability to see, accept, and respond to my will. So as my perspective shrinks, I become less stable, less sane. That's going to manifest in one of two directions. You have either what's called affective disorders or personality disorders. And again, we're painting with a very, very broad brush here. There's sure, a high sure. comorbidity rate. Just, yeah, just. Right. Okay, brush off. So affective disorders are things that are going to um, impact on our mood, bipolar, um, depression, anxiety. And then you have personality disorders. Those like narcissistic, uh, antisocial, um, borderline, and so on. So depending on you know, what category the person falls into, that's how you're going to need to deal with it. Let's take the category of personality disorders because those are going to be the toughest cookies. The people who are depressed and down, uh, you know, they, they don't like where they are as much as you, know, you may not like where they are. They can be their own worst enemy. They're difficult, but they're not going to traipse into your boundaries in the same way that personality disorder will. Because by personality, personality disorder, it's like this. Because we're wired to connect, but if I don't feel worthy of connection, my surrogate is going to be control. Because if I can't connect with you, make no mistake, I'm going to try to control you, which is why one thing that all personality dis uh, disorders share is that they can be controlling. And again, we're painting with a very, very broad brush here. So the best way to deal with it is to understand the mindset. And it, uh, one is you've got to set very clear boundaries. Actually, never get angry again. There's... Uh, I talk a lot about asserting yourself with people who can't hear no. What do you do right. with the person that doesn't respect your boundaries, that doesn't um, re respect you, uh, that is never wrong, you know, the kind of person who's, who's always certain but rarely right. 
you know, they always believe what they, they can't admit they were wrong, so on. You've got to, whatever degree you can, again, there's a lot that goes in here, is have as much empathy as you can, validate, recognize that what they need really is to feel your love and respect. When they feel that, it gives them sort of the embers of feeling good themselves. Telling a person like this, you're wrong, calm down, don't all that stuff, it goes out the window. You really just have to work, uh, try to focus on as much empathy and validation. At the same time, set those boundaries for keeping them from coming into your space and how you set them in different conversation. But that's uh, overall, that's like the, the, the landscape, how to deal with it, is try to connect as much as you can, recognizing no matter what their exterior, they are coming from a place of perverse low self-esteem and insecurity. And you only feed it more by telling them that they're wrong or they made a mistake or how dare you or by yelling. By trying to connect, empathize, and validate, you help to seal that breach, albeit temporarily. And setting boundaries helps to keep them from drifting into your space. Beautiful, beautiful. I remember that the title is Boundaries or Burnouts. Of that, of that title, the, uh, I think you had that, Boundaries or Burnouts, which is exactly the, you have boundaries, you're gonna be burnt out. All right, so we're gonna take some questions, Ariel. Um, we could be here all night talking to tell you the truth, but uh, yeah. obviously there's a time for everything. So if you want to, let's just take some questions. But I, I probably, I, I can almost guarantee you've probably answered them already in your questions. I think we, we pretty much talked, talked about everything. Go ahead. Okay. Do we need to work on traumas as adults? That's one of the questions. Great question. It's a great question. Uh, if, if you're suffering with trauma, then, then uh, by all means. Um, trauma, there, there've been some great advancements very recently in terms of trauma. Uh, so I would encourage you to, if you are suffering with a trauma that's not been healed, to seek out someone who specializes in trauma therapy. Uh, you know, your garden variety therapist could do it in much the same way that an internist could probably do some sort of, you know, heart surgery, right. but you want a cardiologist or, you know, heart surgeon for that. So I would go to someone specialized in trauma and there are different types of therapies. Um, some more effective than others, and there's no silver bullet. Um, but uh, it, if it's something that's impacting the quality of your life and relationships in a negative way, uh, then it makes sense to go ahead and to, to try to, to seal that, that, that trauma, uh, it's called the trauma loop. We get caught up in it. And every time we, we feel that sensation, it's like we're back experiencing it again, because it was never really sealed up. So a good mm -hmm. trauma therapist will be able to work through the stuff um, hopefully more quickly than not, uh, and then, and then go forward. But you got to appreciate, or I would encourage you to recognize everyone's walking around with stuff. Some we all stuff, have our, yeah. you know, traumas, sometimes it's called compound traumas, not necessarily one big magnificent event. It was little stuff that happened. And, you know, you could spend your entire life in therapy, which I don't encourage, you know, do what you can to get yourself whole and healthy. End of the day is on, the yeah. best, with the best things you can do to heal yourself is to go forward and be much like and be successful and you'll Man. see trauma in the rear view mirror. If you can't do that, by all means, go, you know, put the car in reverse. But at some point, you got to put the car in drive. Beautiful. So how do you balance between self-care and care for others without being egocentric? Another, a sharp question again. If you're no good to you, you're no good to anyone else. Meaning that, you know, a good example is if you're, you're making kiddish. Right. If you make the kiddish, you make the bracha and then pour right. the grape Beautiful. juice wine to everyone else. Nobody's yotze. Nobody benefits. You have to make sure you drink and then everyone else satisfied. So the degree to and it, that question is only asked by a, a good hearted person. People who are not assume that they're already doing more than enough anyway. So <laughs> I, I, my suspicion is you, you probably give more, you know, it's th then maybe you, you're always able to. There are a lot of different barometers, but Perky Yavos, Ethics of the Father, says get yourself a friend, the rabbi, because even the wisest of men doesn't have the objectivity that someone else can give them. So we don't always have clarity, which might make sense sometimes to speak it over with somebody and say, hey, am I seeing this clearly? This person wants me to watch their cat and donate a kidney. And you know what? I'm not so sure if I'm up for that. Um, <laughs> or they may say, you know what? This person wants me to you know, give them a ride and I gave them a ride three years ago and so on. And so it may be our own stuff that's getting in the way. We don't always have the clarity. So you speak it over with somebody. Um, but that is a very good question. And again, I would encourage you to recognize that simply giving to somebody else because you can't stand up and say no is not chesed. It's you're being robbed with consent. Chesed means doing kindness means you can say yes, you can say no, and you choose to say yes. It's a difference between giving a donation and being robbed. 
You know, when this person says, you know, can I have your watch and you're in a bad neighborhood, they're not really asking for your watch, right? right. So, you know, you don't really have a choice. So you can convince yourself, oh, I'm being a really great person, I'm giving, 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 but you're not. If you don't feel like you can say no, guilt-free. Gadalia, do you want to add to that? I think, I think David uh, answered that, I think pretty much. With your permission, could I add something? I remember it was probably from your lectures that I picked up, Gedalia. We say we have to lercha kamocha, right? The have to lercha kamocha, love your friend like yourself. The parameter of loving others is how much you love yourself. And I, that really goes back to what right. Dr. Lieberman said. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is, what's the difference between healthy influ influence towards people versus unhealthy control of people? And also, how do you become control of yourself? Okay, I'm, I'm not so sure about the question. Let me go ahead and answer it as, as my understanding, but if I didn't get it right, just let me know. Uh, and so look, you know, it's, it's, I think if the question is at what point can you impact positively somebody else without being wary that they may mm. be dragging you into the quicksand, right? You look to pull somebody up, they could just easily pull you down. Right. You gotta be very, very, very careful, careful about the impact that the environment has on our mindset, on our values, our ideals, our beliefs. Our, there's a myriad of studies and I can share them if you want um, about how our environment and the people we surround ourselves with, we know this by Karach, right? With, um, uh, he was closest um, with uh, Ruvain, right? 250 members of the Shevet Ruvain were, were caught up in with Karach because they were closest in proximity. And they got dragged into it. Just being around people who are negative, who have values that are antithetical to what you want, even if you withstand the temptation, you've right. just, you spoke about decision fatigue, you just used up a lot of juice. So you want to be careful. Doing chesed and helping lift people up is fantastic. But as soon as you believe that it's going to drag you down, then you've got to take a step back and get guidance from somebody who can help you to see the situation clearly and to make sure that you're solid before you extend that hand out. Or especially if, if you're giving the advice and not listening and they just want to, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of the things. I will, I will give advice to tons of people. But the yeah. number one, you have to listen and you have to put an effort. I can't put more effort than you can. Yeah, so if people, you're willing to put the effort yeah. and you're willing to listen, then I can help you. But if, if you're just there to like, well, you know, well, how do I know this works? How do I know that one? Then I, you know, obviously I know, it's not. I know, I know. Yeah. People always ask me if I mind giving advice because, you know, people ask you it and I'm happy to. I mind people not taking it, but I'm happy to give right, it. Right, right. One of the best ways Reb Nachman talked about if you're dealing with people, if you're, especially if you're caring, you have to make sure you do a lot of judgment on yourself, a lot of work on yourself, so the negativity doesn't get to you. It's very, yeah. very important. A lot of a lot of therapists get drained out. A lot of people get drained out because they're, they're giving the, the talk, but they themselves are not. They don't. Right. They're not holding on that. Right. 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 Okay. The next question is: How do you get over being bullied? Uh, so. Bullying from childhood is, is, it can be a type of, it can be trauma, certainly traumatic yeah. um, and it affects different people differently. You see different personalities. Some kids get bullied and they, they, you call them a name. We see this different natures. You call them a name, you push them down and they're like this. And then the next day they're like, oh yeah, I think whatever. Other kids, somebody says something that they may have heard a name and for the next 60 years, they're walking around this baggage because right. somebody said, oh, you're stupid or you're dumb or whatever. Um, and it has to do with our, our nature uh, because our personality is a confluence of nature and nurture, of our temperament, of, of what we come into the world with, and then how that's shaped. Um, so the person who is wearing or, or still has that feelings of, of a trauma from bullying uh, would do well to maybe work through it end of the day is what's very powerful to recognize is that experience was necessary. That person was a mm. shliach from Hashem. So they had no independent autonomy or power. It was there for you to learn a lesson. So ask yourself rather, you know, uh, uh, instead of the other question you may have been asking yourself, ask yourself, what was the lesson for me? Try to get the answer and then you're done. You just sealed it up because the whole point of it was for you to learn something. But we never right. ask ourselves or we rarely ask ourselves the right question. It's true with difficult people. You know, we bemoan these vampires that drain us, but we never say, what is the message that's I'm the supposed to learn? Right, what's the lesson for me? Once we get the lesson, then that's why they were here. And then poof, whatever was weighing on us is gone. 
this is a lot of my emphasis. What's the lesson behind it? Focus on the message, not the messenger. And then That's right. you'll fix both. But we can't spend all our, our lives on messengers. We gotta focus no. on the message. Focus on the message that we're getting, constantly getting from heaven. Right. That's why, because I'll say, anger is akin to idolatry. If I get mad at you because of something you did, I'm taking a shot out of the equation. Who put you in my life? Who put you in the road? Who right. put you in front of me? It's a very, very important concept, and, and, and people, don't, it's very hard to see it if they don't have that relationship. Yes, right. Because again, if I'm egocentric, I'm going to assume not just other people do things to me, but Hashem is as well. In other right, words, the right. creator of the universe knows how rotten I am, how despicable I am, because I've done. Of course, he did this because he's trying to get back to me. Right? And, and then we end up with this, with this warped concept of some sort of you know, vengeful creator, and we lose sight of the fact that we are as it is if we are his only child and he created everything for us, loves us more than we can fathom. And we, when we don't own that, it's natural to assume I got a flat tire because God hates me. Right. Wow. Okay. The next question. We've all been there. We've all been there in that, in that victim mindset. We've all been yeah. there. Ready for the next question? Yes. Okay, what is the fine line in explaining to a child the difference between parenting and chinuch versus being in control or upset at them? For example, if the child feels very frustrated for being pointed out when they're doing something wrong and they should be doing better. Okay, so lots to talk about here. Uh, in an ideal world, a parent should not show their frustration or anger or resentment toward a child, period. What you can show is that you're disappointed in your child's behavior, but that is way too much power to give a child that they can knock you off your emotional perch and get you upset because of something they've done. Not only is it too much power, but it undermines their betachen, their ability to be able to trust in you that you're rock solid. Mm. I, again, it, wow. doesn't mean that, that, that it doesn't mean that you don't say, I'm disappointed, but you do not walk around huffing and puffing and resentful and disconnect because a child did something you don't like. It's business as usual. You love and accept. That's different, different from approval. And this is something that when I talk about chinek, it comes up a lot. And it's well-meaning, well-intentioned parents get it wrong. You do not tell a child um, that they've messed up on something where they can't fix it. You know, like for example, a child does something. It's like, oh, you missed the chance for a big mitzvah. You blew it. Why? What do you, people don't move forward from a position of being beaten up on. They move forward right. from a position of positivity. When they get it right, that's when you charge it with positivity and celebrate it. But to show your frustration, anger towards a child, what you've just told them is that you're no longer in control of your emotions. They are. And now what happens the next time you may do something to the child, you bump into them or something doesn't go their way. You want to tell them, you know what, that person's a shliach, shake it off. Whatever. And you can't because they're going to walk around moping, resentful in the exact same way that you modeled it for them. Oof. Beautiful. Great, great answer. How do we surrender to hardship and how do we accept revealed good and believe that we are deserving of it? Well, another powerful, powerful question. Let me just, with your permission, to die, remind um, people watching that on Tarani time, I have but almost 200 lectures that flesh out a lot of these ideas in more depth if, um, if they're so inclined. Um, the question is, what was specifically about what? Where do you want to focus on? How does she deal with hardship? And how does she view her? I believe, how, how do you... How okay, you let me how repeat you it. How hardship? do we surrender to hardship? And how do we accept revealed good and believe that we are deserving of it? Okay, so two great independent questions. One is mm -hmm. this. When you're going through something difficult, uh, the Yetzirah does one of two things. The, the ego does one of two things. It will either deny it, and say, I don't care, like, like a small kid or someone who wants, it doesn't matter, it doesn't hurt, I don't care, I can't care. Or they're going to wrap themselves up in this blanket of self-pity and go from, you know, one spoonful of ice cream to five cartons of ice cream and say, I'm no good, I'm worthless, I'm awful, this is terrible, my wife, whatever. The way we move through pain is through acknowledging that this is a moment to be in pain. You can't deny reality and expect to get out of it. So I deny reality by saying, I don't care. I deny reality by saying my whole world is ruined. No, right now I'm gonna honor, this is something that's painful. Somebody said something. I heard Gedalia Fenster, I heard Lieberman talk, I read the books, I saw the whatever, but still it stings. 
this person said this, this happened. You're a human being, you're entitled to feel pain, accept it, honor it. This is a moment to be in pain. That's good, that's healthy, that's normal. At some point, that acceptance should be wrapped up in self-compassion. Self-compassion elicits what's called a neuroaffective response. When you talk to yourself kindly and lovingly, it's the same as if somebody else were to speak to you kindly and lovingly. And that connection, that, um, that empathy helps us to feel less alone and more grounded and more connected. And with that self-talk of self-compassion and acceptance, and then there are a number of other things you can do. There's writing it out, journaling can be effective, speaking it to somebody is very cathartic. However you wanna channel it, then you begin to sort of, it, it dissipates as you move forward. But deny it or wrap yourself up in it, don't move forward, mm -hmm. you're stuck. You also have to believe that most of these, the problem ends up usually becoming the solution. Um, and that's, and I, you know, we think the solution's outside of us. The problem is, and ends up becoming the solution. Right. And nice. once you start an answering better questions, like, you know, I tell people in recovery, you know, your, your addiction became your spiritual awakening. The problem is the solution. And I would say the majority of the times people recognize that the problem ended up becoming the solution. When you have that mindset and you recognize that God created the world out of love and he's, he's, he's only love. It's just right now the, the, the Yeshua, the salvation is hidden from you right now. It's concealed. What we need to do is he hasn't abandoned you, but it's concealed. So you have to cry out sometimes from the depths of your heart and ask your creator to open, to, 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 to reveal himself. So what true. I've seen is that, what I've seen is that, that always the problem ends up becoming the solution. Uh, oh. It's in the, in, 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 the same, in the same situation. It's not even an yeah. outside issue. It's, yeah. it's yeah. right here in your hands. That's right. It's just you don't, you don't see it. That's right. It's not, it's not if, revealed if, to you. Right. If, if we're able to embrace that everything Hashem does is custom made, tailor made for a good and for a growth, there's right. nothing by circumstance, nothing by happenstance, nothing. It's all for us. So this experience was necessary. Now right. the question is, what is the message? What's the message? And, 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 and God wants to hear you. He wants to hear sometimes he wants to hear the cries. Right. To, to, to open up my mind. Many times I say, create the world. I know nothing. I know nothing. Please open up my mind. And, and just the simplicity in those prayers have so much. I stay away from any kind of sophistication, straight simplicity. That's my, that's my secret. The greatest truths are the simplest. Anyone can yeah. complicate things. <laughs> it's easy to make things complicated. Exactly. Exactly. All right. We'll take one more question and we'll, and yeah, we'll wrap it up. I have a question. So, you know, Gidal, you always talk about breathing. And uh, Doc, people say that, you know, they, they just want to blow some steam off. How would you connect letting go of anger and breathing? How do those two connect together? Wow, great question. Once again, yeah. each of these questions are an hour. But um, so it's like this. First off, in psychology, we, we used to think that uh, the, a person was like a steam kettle, that the anger, the frustration would build and build and build. And if you didn't have a punching bag, whatever, it turns out, exactly what Chazal say, that the more angry you get the, and express it, the more the blood boils and the more you justify why you're angry and so on. And it doesn't dissipate, it, it enrages it further. So that doesn't mean that you suppress the anger. What it does mean is you need a healthy expression for it. Mm -hmm. So in the moment when you just sort of unleash, that's not healthy. You wanna be able to express it in a productive, healthy way um, and certainly not suppress it or repress it. Regarding breathing, the reason why that's so effective, and you know, you can read any book on anger, and I, I didn't want to put it in mind, but I had to because it's it's MS, it's truth. Breathing works. The reason why yeah. when a person breathes, it the entire central nervous system is made up of the brain and spinal cord. And just speaking just broad strokes here, is that when you breathe, you're relaxing the whole central nervous system. You're the fight, flight, or freeze response, which engaged because you got scared, right? We said at the beginning. Fear breeds anger. So I got scared. If I'm able to breathe and uh, become more calm, then I'm going to become less angry. Breathing also not only calms the central nervous system, but it also um, allows for us to literally take a breath, to take a moment. And within that space, you gain more perspective. When a person loses perspective, it's because like physical perspective, it's right in their face. So that little bit of time can buy you a lot of, uh, of emotional strength. Uh, but yeah, deep breathing, the number of other things you can do when a person feels angry, it's you relax the soldiers, uh, uh, shoulders, you relax your jaw, you try and focus on something positive. 
And it's amazing at how quickly you can rewire the brain as little as 30 days to just mm. no longer have a hair trigger response to anger. Whatever happens, you're just able to deal with it so much more calmly and effectively. Beautiful. All right, beautiful. David, it was so, such a pleasure. Such a pleasure, David. Such a pleasure. I, I know people are going to get tremendous amount of results. We've talked, we've talked about so many items and we, we kept the practicality. But again, guys, free will works. Never get angry again. Strongly recommend a lot of the classes have this content in it. And it, it's just it's something to be constantly reviewed, specifically husband and wife. Strongly recommend. Because if, you, if we're both on the same page, it's much easier. All right, True. guys. Guys, True. have a good night. Have a good night. And good thank God, you again thank for your you. generosity. Continue spreading light. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. Have a great night.